Hey guys, welcome to Rotor Riot, and today we're going to be doing some basic beta flight configuration. It's been a while since we've done this, and new versions of beta flight have come out. So today we're going to be using the latest version, which is beta flight 3.5. If you're watching after a new version has already come out, there should still be a lot of similarities. So stick around with us because today we are going to be configuring our newly built CL1 build. If you haven't seen the build video for this, check the link in the description. Uh, we built this using a lot of our new components including the 2207 Acro hype train motors and our hype train riot control flight controller. So let's get this plugged into beta flight. So with any new flight controller I like to just have a look at the setup page and make sure that everything is kind of responding correctly. And yeah, we've got movement here, so looks good. Let's go ahead and flash this with the latest firmware. So I'm gonna exit out of the configurator and we're gonna go over here to firmware flasher. The Riot Control flight controller is based around an Omnibus F4 target. So we are going to select Omnibus F4 and grab the latest version, which as I said is 3.5.0. So we grab that, load firmware from online. Oh, and I always like to make sure that I've selected full chip erase up here and that's just going to undo any settings that come on the board all right we're just going to do everything from scratch so make sure that's checked and then hit flash firmware and wait all right programming successful so we have the latest firmware version flash to our flight board let's go ahead and connect double check that the IMU is responding and all right everything is looking good so we are just going to run down the different tabs on the left side of the screen so this first tab setup is just to like I said check that everything is working properly you can calibrate the accelerometer if you need to you can check uh, the battery voltage if you have one plugged in or, or anything like that but there's not much to do here so we will just move on down to the ports tab now this is where we tell the flight controller everything that we have hooked up to this so now if you watch the build video you'll recall that we hooked up an RXSR receiver and then we also hooked up a smart port telemetry and then we hooked up a a run cam camera control adapter and then we also hooked up video transmitter telemetry from our VTX uh, now those are four items and as you'll see here we only have three available UARTs most F4 flight controllers only have three configurable UARTs and, and a UART is the the component that allows your flight controller to talk to another component so how do we resolve this well let's start with the receiver so there's two functions of that there's the uh, S bus input so we hooked that up to UART 1 RX inverted because SBUS is an inverted signal and we made sure to do the uh, solder bridge to connect the B pad and the SBUS pad so the, uh, the flight board will receive that inverted signal properly. So what we're gonna do is we are going to check serial RX for UART1. The S port telemetry, that needs its own UART and it needs the transmitting pin of a UART and it needs an inverted UART. So we soldered the S bus signal to the inverted UART1 receiver pad. And what we did is we soldered the smart port wire to UART1TX. Now normally you can't use a single UART for two different functions. So we're actually gonna set up uh, a soft serial and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, why didn't we use one of the other UARTs? Well, there's two reasons for that. The first reason is because we are hooking up uh, four different functions. So we only had three UARTs and we're hooking up four functions. Already there's one issue and then additionally the, the other UARTs don't support inversion. And when we were designing this flight board, we had to decide how many of these uh, these UARTs did we want to invert. And we decided just to, to make the UART1 receiver have an accessible inverter because SBUS is the most commonly used function. And for SmartPort, the only other thing that you might require inversion for, there's a workaround that recovers. So what I'm saying is we're going to circle back around to SmartPort and, and move on. So another thing that we hooked up is the run cam camera control adapter now if you recall from the build video we hooked that up to uart3 so what we're going to do is we're going to go into the uart3 row we're going to find this under peripherals so in peripherals we're going to look down here and here we have run cam device 
we will click that. And now moving on to the last component that we have hooked up, that is our video transmitter. We have video transmitter telemetry hooked up and that's going to allow us to use our flight board to configure the video transmitter. So within the on-screen display, you'll be able to navigate through and change your, your video transmitters channel and band and power level and all that good stuff. So we hooked that up to UART6. So UART6, we're gonna go over here to peripherals again and we are gonna select the the protocol that's appropriate for your given video transmitter. My video transmitter of choice is usually the Immersion Tramp, so I'd be selecting IRC Tramp. For this specific build, we use the Race Day Quads Mach 2, which I believe uses Smart Audio Protocol, so we're gonna select that. And now we will save our settings and get back in here. So moving on from the ports tab, we're gonna get into the configuration tab, quad X with normal prop direction. If you want to run counter rotating props, I have the props spinning outwards rather than inwards relative to the camera. You can click that here and then make sure to adjust your BL Heli settings to, uh, to mash up with that. But I'm just gonna leave it normal. Uh, now getting down into system configuration, we're going to set our, uh, our loop frequencies. So uh, we already have the gyro updating at 8K, but we can, because we have high speed D-shot capable ESCs hooked up, we're gonna be able to run the PID loop faster as well. So we are gonna select eight kilohertz for the PID loop. So now we're running 8K, 8K, and now here we can see the list of sensors that may or may not pertain to us. The riot control doesn't even feature a barometer or magnometer and there's just no use for those sensors in acrobatic freestyle flight. So I'm gonna turn off the magnometer, I'm gonna turn off the barometer. Now we're left with the accelerometer on. Some people like to just turn that off because they, they only ever fly in rate mode and that makes perfect sense. Personally, I leave it on because I do like to have auto level available on a switch just for random diagnostics or in case of fail safe or, whatever use you might have for it. If you look down here, I mean, my CPU load is down at 6%. And, and as we add on more features, it's gonna raise a little bit, but as long as it's it's not getting too high, we have more than enough headroom to, to run our accelerometer as part of the loop. So I'm gonna leave the accelerometer on. If you wanna turn it off to get a little bit more CPU performance out of it, that's, that's fine too. This area right here, you can input the the angle of your FPV camera. Now the only use for that is if you wanted to have the flight controller automate some of the roll and yaw mixing. I really don't recommend doing that. So and I just leave it at zero, it doesn't matter. We're not gonna use any functions associated with that. So moving on here, we have the receiver section. Now we need to pick the receiver type. Now remember back to the port section, we selected UART1 to serve as a serial RX. Well, to correspond with that, we need to select serial based receiver. Now that creates another dropdown and we can select the protocol associated with the receiver that we use. We are using an RSXR FreeSky receiver, which is SBUS protocol. So I'm gonna hit this dropdown and I'm gonna hit SBUS. Moving on to other features, here's where we can turn on some things. The first thing we're gonna hit is soft serial. This is what's gonna enable us to do the, the workaround to get smart port telemetry input into our flight board and give us essentially a fourth UART. So I'm gonna turn on soft serial. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna turn on is telemetry. Just going on what we were saying, we're trying to get telemetry to work with the receiver. So I'm gonna turn on telemetry. Now moving on, here we hit air mode. You may or may not choose to turn on air mode all the time. And air mode is kind of a modifier to the, the PID functionality that uh, affects how the eye turn behaves at low throttle. A lot of people just click on air mode and have it run at all times. Again, my personal preference is to not turn on air mode as a feature, but rather I will set it up on a switch so that I can turn it on and off using my transmitter. The reason that I like to be able to turn it off is that if I wanna do a skid or other contact move like a wall bonk, air mode can 
create some bouncing that you may not want. So I like the ability to turn it off even though 98% of the time I fly with it on. So I'm not gonna check air mode. On-screen display looks like it comes checked on by default, which is good. We do have on-screen display supported by the Raya control. ESC sensor, if you've hooked up ESC telemetry to one of your UARTs, if you're gonna use it for that, that's where you would turn it on. I found no performance benefit to using ESC telemetry in beta flight. I don't even really bother with it. The next item is anti-gravity. This similar to air mode is a, is a modifier to the PID loop that also affects I term relative to fast throttle changes. Uh, I haven't found any reason to want to have that on a switch. So I just turn it on as a feature. So it's always active and it comes on like that by default. So we'll just leave it. And the last option is dynamic filter, which again is on by default. And you definitely want that dynamic filter is an awesome function of beta flight. It's constantly looking at the gyro signal and looking for noise and filtering that out so that your flight controller is only responding to the movement and not to vibration. It's not a perfect science, but it does a really great job. Okay, we have another column. So I'm gonna go back up here to the top. Uh, ESC motor features. Here's where we're gonna pick our ESC motor protocol. Uh, the default is brush for some reason. And no, we don't want that. What we want is D-Shot 1200. Uh, because again, we are using BL Heli 32-bit ESCs. It can support that. If you're not using a 32-bit ESC, you might wanna run D-Shot 300 or D-Shot 600, but we'll get away with 1200 just fine. And here is where you will set your motor idle throttle value. The default of 4.5% is fine. Maybe you want a lower, maybe a little higher. I'm just gonna leave it for now. If, uh, if when you looked at the setup page, if roll or pitch was reversed, or if the, you had to mount the board upside down or at an angle or whatever, using this area here, board and center alignment, that's where you can compensate for that. But we mounted the board with the arrow pointing toward the nose as it should be. So there's no center alignment required. So we're just gonna leave all those zeros. Um, jumping down here to arming. Default is 25. I highly recommend you change this to 180. This is going to allow you to arm your quad no matter what angle it's at. So say you get stuck in a tree and you're upside down, you're gonna still be able to arm the motors and try to shake yourself out. Whereas if you left it at the default 25 degrees, unless your quad is pretty much flat, you're not gonna be able to arm your quad. So it's a safety thing. So just be, be, be extra precautious that you are only hitting your arm switch when the quad is on the ground ready to take off. Um, and that's gonna give you the ability to maybe shake yourself out of some trees. RSSI signal strength, if you're using analog output, you can use it for that, but we're not doing that. We're not doing 3D, we're not doing GPS. We already covered the other features section. So now we're at the D-Shot beacon configuration. Uh, you can select one of five different tones. Sometimes I've honestly found that uh, beacon tone number one doesn't work for some reason. I always just like pick three. I think Stinger Swarm uses five. It doesn't matter. It's personal preference. It just changes the, the pitch of your, um, of your motor beeps. Um, because with D-Shot, you have D-Shot commands available, things like turtle mode and beepers. So we don't hook up beepers anymore. You don't need to hook up a beeper. You can actually use your motors as a beeper, which is really cool. Um, and I'm gonna check both of these functions, which is going to ensure that our motors are able to serve as a beeper when we hit the, uh, the, the aux channel for it and that the motors will beep in the case of a fail safe. So just check both of those. Now this last long section for beeper, this just applies to an actual beeper if you solder it to your flight controller, which again, we're not using. So it doesn't matter what I check or don't check. And that concludes everything we're gonna do on the configuration page. So I'm gonna save and reboot. All right, so finally, we're gonna resolve the whole free sky telemetry with smart port thing. So remember what we did in configuration, we enabled soft serial. So now what we need to do is we need to assign a soft serial UART to a pin. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump all the way to CLI. So what you're going to need to type in here is resource serial underscore TX 11 A 0 9 and then hit enter. And this is going to assign the soft serial functionality to the UART 1 TX pin which is where we soldered this smart port wire. Again, reference the build video if you wanna check that out. And the last thing we need to do is type save and hit enter. And that's gonna reboot our flight controller once again. Now, 
we are going to return to the ports tab and look down here we now have an additional uart called soft serial one what we're going to do is we're going to go to the telemetry output column and we're going to select smart port hit save and just like that we will now have all of the functions that we hooked up to our flight controller the receiver smart port the run cam camera control adapter and the video transmitter telemetry. So that's a great little hack to get your flight board doing lots of different things. Now we can move on to the power and battery section. In this section is where you can type in numbers to, to, to calibrate your voltage and current sensor. Out of the box, it should be fine. I've got a hypo battery here that is fully charged and you can tell because it lights up green. I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. And I can see that my battery voltage is 16.9. I know the battery's charged is 16.8. I honestly, I'd just call that good enough. If I really wanted to fix it, I could knock down the scale by one point here. And yep, now it's down to 16.8, that's fine. And then as far as calibrating the current, that's a little bit more involved and is gonna require you to, uh, to fly a battery and measure the capacitance that you've pulled out of it and recharge it. And Joshua Bartle has a great video on that. And it's a little bit more advanced of a thing that I want to cover in a basic beta flight setup. So link in the description to check out Joshua Jardwell's tutorial on that if you're more interested. But again, out of the box, it's, it's going to be really close, close enough for you to be able to fly around and, and get uh, usable information on your on-screen display. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on. And now here we have PIDs, filters, and, and other performance-y things. So I'm actually going to start with rates because uh, for the most part, your rates are, are fixed values that uh, are dependent on your preference as a pilot. So I have rates that I enjoy flying and, and uh, you, can, you can fly the stock rates and adjust things as needed. You can think of the RC rate as drawing a linear relationship between stick input and quad response. And then you can curve that relationship using either super rate or RC expo super rate will bump up the end of the stick response, meaning that toward the end of your stick travel, it will increase the drones response. And you can think of exponential as dampening the, the response closer to center. So closer to center, it'll reduce the quads response. I, I actually don't use any RC Expo. I just use super rates. So, I mean, here are my rates. I set an RC rate of 1.2 for roll and pitch. Then I set my roll to 7.4. So that's gonna give me a little bit more snappability on the roll. And then my pitch, I decrease a bit. Just my flying style, I don't do a lot of fast pitch maneuvers. So I, I, I just decrease that. Again, personal preference. A lot of people do like fast flips, so it's just whatever you want. Uh, yaw, I do totally differently. Yaw, I will jack up the RC rate a lot. I'll set that to like 1.75. And then I'll drop the super rate down to like 0.4. We'll leave that. And now if you look over at the rates graph, what you'll see is the, the red and green lines, which are roll and pitch, have a good curve to them. So I've got some soft response in the center of the stick and then more snappy fast flip as I get to the end of the stick travel. Whereas yaw, the blue line is pretty linear. I've got a little bit of a, of a curve to it, but for the most part, yaw is a linear response. And that's because yaw is, is just a lot more passive on quadcopters. And, and a linear yaw response is pretty common for helicopter setups. And I used to fly helicopters. So again, Personal preference, I like yaw to feel linear and my pitch and roll to have more of a curve to them. No real right or wrong way, whatever suits your flying style. Now we've got the P, the I, the D, and the F, which is a, a new thing kind of. So you got your proportional, your integral, your derivative, and your feed forward. Feed forward essentially affects your stick response. It's related to your PIDs, but it's more going to affect how your rates feel. So regardless of how I set up my PIDs, I have a pretty stand, I have a pretty much go-to setup for feed forward. I'll set up 80 and 80 on roll and pitch, and then y'all move up to 100. Again, trying to make y'all feel as responsive as I can, despite the fact that y'all is very passive on quadcopters. And then while we're on the subject of feed forward, down here in PID controller settings, you've got a feed forward transition, and that sets the point at which you meet that feed forward value. I just I use 
0.5. So at half stick travel, that's when I attain the full value of, of 80 feed forward for roll, for example. Again, it's all personal preference. You're gonna have to play with it and find what works exactly for you. This is what I use. Now your PID values, totally dependent on the components you use on your quad. It's gonna take tuning to your exact quad. That being said, sometimes I kind of cheat my PID tuning. I found that you can just kind of bump up all the values a little bit and it flies pretty much fine. I mean, honestly, stock values on modern firmwares fly so good you can totally fly the stock pids it's gonna fly great it's just tuning out little issues like prop wash and bobbles and things like that um so you can use the stock pids as a baseline or you can do what i do and just bump things up a little bit so i'm just gonna do like 50 50 maybe not roll that high i'm just gonna do 50 55, I'm gonna bump the derivative up to 35. For pitch, I'm gonna do 60. We'll do 55 on that. Maybe I'll drop this down to 50 over here. We'll do derivative 35 again. Eh, wait, pitch needs a little more. 37, maybe derivative come down a bit. Yaw, make that 70. Eh, another 50, now we'll leave it at 45. Dude. That's total guesswork. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna have to tweak things a little bit, but I'm pretty confident that'll fly good. If you're building a similar quad, go ahead and put these numbers in. It'll fly, it's, it's gonna fly good. You're gonna wanna tweak it, but I'm, I'm just saying. The next whole section down here for angle slash horizon, that's if you're flying with auto level modes. For acrobatic freestyle, you don't wanna be using auto level, so there's no, there's no real sense in, in tuning that. The stock values are gonna be fine. Um, PID controller settings. Throttle boost is a new thing. I don't, I don't really know what it does. Same with absolute control. I don't, honestly, I don't really use those settings at this point. They're new features to beta flight. Um, you can play with them, uh, find whatever whatever you prefer for, for your tune and for your stick feel. But again, as a basic setup video, I'm just gonna leave them stock. Uh, but there are some features down here that I want to turn on. So uh, I term rotation, again, I'm not even sure what that does, but it's on by default and Joshua told me I should use it. So we're gonna use it. <laughs> so just leave that on. Uh, VBAT PID compensation. This one, I actually know what it does. Now I can get smart again. VBAT PID compensation scales up your PID values as your battery voltage drops. So as you are discharging your battery and the, the average voltage is going down, your quad would get less responsive because it would have less power to work with. But because your flight controller knows your battery voltage, it can scale up your PID and give you back some of that responsiveness. So good thing to have on. Uh, smart feed forward, again, preference thing, new feature, your call. I haven't played with it much, so I'm just not even gonna touch it. I term relax, again, a new feature. Don't fully know what it does, but I know Joshua Bardwell told me to use it, so it's on. It's what it is. For anti-gravity, so anti-gravity is a great feature. Remember, we, we left that on earlier. Anti-gravity boosts your I term as you move the throttle stick rapidly. Um, a common behavior that you, if you've been flying for a while that you may have tried to combat with your tune before is the tendency of the drone to bobble on the pitch axis as you move the throttle. Anti-gravity does a great job of, of getting rid of that. Uh, the stock value of five is fine. You might find you want a little bit more, you want a little bit less. Um, you're just gonna have to tune that dependent on the quad. Uh, there's different algorithms that it can use. I found that the new smooth version works really well. Uh, so really there's nothing we're gonna change there, but it's a great feature. So thanks Betaflight for having it. Uh, and that's everything we're gonna do for our PIDs and rates. Before we move on over here to this other sub tab for filters, I'm gonna hit save just to make sure we don't lose any of the work we've done, even though most of my work was just blindly following Bardwell. Anyways, filter, boo! We're in our filter setting. So uh, the good news is there's not a whole lot that you have to do. The new defaults on the newest version of beta flights, they're, they're great. The only reason I even wanted to open it up is say that you might want to reduce the filtering or even turn off the, the second stage low pass filter on the gyro. Um, just because on our riot control board, we designed in a soft mounted gyro as well as uh, having the board itself soft mounted. So there's a lot of vibration filtering built into the hardware of the board itself. So you can, you can get away with removing some of the gyro low pass. I would probably fly it with the stock filter settings as is and then 
play with it tentatively, you know, change the setting and then test Harvard, see if the motors are hot and kind of do it like that. But I guess what I'm getting at, typically when using a riot control, I can get away with turning off this second stage gyro low pass filter with no problems. So I'll turn it off and I'll just keep an eye on things the first time I fly it and we'll hit save. And now this brings us to the receiver tab. So for this, I'm gonna need to have my transmitter turned on. Um, Welcome to Open woo! We gotta get power to our receiver, so we're gonna plug in our battery again. And now we can see the response of our receiver on our screen. We can move around the sticks. Uh, and the first thing we wanna check for is channel mapping. And what we wanna see is for our sticks to be corresponding to the correct bars on the receiver tab. And yeah, it's all over the place. So we're gonna check a different channel map. We'll try the one labeled for free sky. Nope, that doesn't work. We'll do the one for spectrum, even though it is free sky. And throttle is throttle, yaw is yaw, pitch is pitch. Roll. All right, looking good. So what we wanna see is that when throttle is down, the bars to the left, throttle up, bar to the right, cool. Yaw to the left puts the bar to the left. Cool. Pitch down, put bar to the left. Nice. And roll left, bar to the left. Everything looks good. The other thing that we need to do while we're in here is, is follow the note that they're providing us, which is to make sure that the endpoints and the dead bands are set correctly. So from stick end to stick end, we need to see travel of 1,000 to 2,000. So st let's start with throttle, and we're seeing that it goes from 988 to 2011, so we need to adjust our travel in the radio. We're just gonna raise our minimum up to where it's at 1,000, and then we'll raise throttle all the way, and we'll lower our maximum down until it's at 2,000. I like when they match, but on a lower quality radio like this, you're not always gonna get them to match. Just depends on your radio. So we've made all the adjustments needed in the Tyrannus to ensure that when our sticks are centered, they're giving us a reading of 1500, and at the endpoints they go from 1000 to 2000. The next thing that we're gonna do is change the threshold. Uh, you're gonna wanna set your stick low threshold, um, and this is for throttle as low as possible. Uh, what we can see is we're every time I hit the throttle all the way down, I'm hitting 1,000, so I don't need to run as high as 1050, which is the default. I can run 10.005. You wanna get that low because everything from zero, which is 1,000, to the setting that you define is kind of a dead band. You don't get any throttle response. So, I'd, I mean, I'd like to set it at 1,000, but just in case I lower this stick and I don't get all the way down to 1,000, I'll give myself a little bit of wiggle room. Similarly, for this stick high threshold, we don't need to give up power, so we'll set that to 1995. Now RC dead band. This is good to take out uh, any kind of uh, jittering or inaccuracy at stick center. Typically if, if I'm using a higher quality transmitter and my sticks all hold a, a signal of 1500 very reliably, I'll run zero or, or maybe a very low value like four um, just to, to soften up the center sticks just a little bit more, but on this particular transmitter, I'm having some trouble with the roll channel. I'm not sure sure what. I could keep going through the, the settings, but if you run into something like I'm having where you can't quite get it to hit 1500 reliably, you're seeing here it's outputting 1505, you take care of that using dead band. So for RC dead band, I'm gonna use at least five plus a little bit extra. So I'll type in seven you know what i'm going to type in eight just just because it's being really annoying yeah now it's stuck at 18. i think there's a bad gimbal in here honestly um and then you can set yaw independently if you need to uh now down in this setting you've got rc smoothing you can set a, a different uh, smoothing type uh, interpolation is the default i think the beta flight devs recommend filtering but i like interpolation i'm just going to leave the default and we'll hit save Moving on, we've still got our battery connected so that our receiver is powered and we're gonna set our mode. So what we're gonna be able to do is as we go down for each mode, we'll just move the switch that we want associated with it. So for arm, I'm gonna hit add range and I want my arming switch to be this one. So I move this switch and now it's assigned to auxiliary channel three, depending on exactly how I've assigned my switches. 
and then I'll set the range. So I know a, a cool thing to do with arming is on a three position switch, set the arm to the center position. That makes it really easy to disarm in case of emergency. So yeah, when this stick is in the center, I'm armed. Up is out of that range, down is out of that range, good to go. Um, now for angle mode, that's a flight mode. I want my flight mode switch to be over here. So I'm gonna flip that. Uh, I'm gonna set it up so that when the, I'm gonna do when the switch is all the way away from me, that's angle mode, because that should be, all the way away should be like the, the gummiest or the safest scenario. So if angle mode's kind of more beginnery, I'll put that the switch away from me is angle mode, fine. Uh, the next thing here is horizon mode. Beta flight, please remove horizon mode. It is awful. Don't ever use it. It's so unpredictable. It's basically auto level mode that when you move the stick enough, lets you flip over. It's so unpredictable. I think it's not safe. Don't use horizon mode. If you want an auto level mode, use angle mode. Moving on, we've got no need for head free fails. Also head free, that's maybe something you'd want for some weird line of sight stuff, but no. Uh, fail safe, that's for testing. Head adjust, I don't know, maybe that's for head tracking. Don't even know what that is. Beeper, we did set up our uh, ESCs with D-Shot so that we can use our ESCs as a beeper. So I want my beeper switch to be this thing. So I'm gonna hit save and now I believe, so now when I flip this switch, I get the motors beeping. So I don't have to add any additional hardware and I have a beacon. So if I lose my quad, I can look for it and all that good stuff. Pretty cool stuff. Moving on, air mode. As we covered, I like to leave air mode on uh, it's a switch, so I've got my flight mode switch. So all the way away from me is angle mode, which is auto level. In the middle position, I'll have that be kind of standard acro mode. So I'll just assign nothing to that. Acro mode is kind of the default. And then for air mode, I'll have that, I'm gonna push that toward me, be all the way toward me. So on the aux one channel, I've got it set up that all the way away from me is auto level mode, i.e. angle mode. In the center position, it's no mode, which means acro mode. And then all the way toward me is air mode. All right, moving on, FPV angle mix. I mentioned that, I don't use it, don't recommend you use it. We've got some modes here toward uh, camera functionality. That's not actually the, the camera thing that we have hooked up, that's for if you have uh, like a run cam split that can do HD recording, so we're gonna ignore all those. And now that brings us to flip over after crash. That's what we typically call turtle mode. I like to put that on the same switch as my beeper because they're both things that I would use after a crash. So uh, all the way away from me is no functionality. The middle is beeper, and then I'll say all the way toward me. That's my turtle mode, save. Cool. Another great feature you can have, but ugh, the way I've got my transmitter set up, I think I've run out of channels and switches, unfortunately. Oh, you know what? I could use part of this because uh, I want to show you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just set it up on the same switch as my arm switch. So if I'm not armed, it will enable this last mode, which is VTX pit mode. That is an awesome thing that you can set up if you have a video transmitter capable of tele telemetry and pit mode. Uh, what you can do is with the flip of a switch, put your video transmitter into pit mode. That will essentially power down your video transmitter. I love having this on a switch because when I'm flying with other people, when I come in for a landing, I flip that switch, it cuts out my video, and I'm not gonna be interfering with them. Or if I need to plug in and do something and not interfere with them, I can use that really great thing, but it, it really only works if you one, have the mode set up, and two, have a high quality video transmitter that gets in and out of pit mode reliably. And the last things available to us are Paralyze and Acro Trainer. Um, some cool features, but we're not gonna be using them, so save. Um, the Motors tab. This is where, with the battery plugged in, and the props off, keep your props off, we can raise our motors a little bit. We got them spinning up here, and this is gonna let us check motor direction. And later we're gonna go into BL Heli and we're gonna fix motor directions. So we've got one is spinning correctly, two is backwards. I'm gonna guess three is backwards, and yes it is. And I'm gonna guess four is correct, and yes it is. So we're gonna need to go into BL Heli and change the directions of motors two and three. Um, if you wanna set your motor idle low as possible, here's where you can figure out how low you can set it. The motors are jittering at 1006, and if I raise them up to 1008, they're spinning reliably. I would still add a little bit more 
So 1010. That means if the motors are spinning reliably at 1010, you could go back to the configuration tab and lower your idle as low as 1%. I don't recommend it. Your PID performance isn't going to be as great. So I, I would stick with something closer to the default that's 4%, even though we're seeing that the motors are spinning at 1010, which translates to 1%. Uh, now I can unplug the battery. We can jump into the OSD. Here's where we can configure our on-screen display. The first thing I would recommend doing is setting the video format appropriately. So depending on your camera, you will either have a PAL or an NTSC camera. Most of them are NTSC, this camera is. So I'm gonna hit NTSC. And what you see there is that it cropped the preview window in which we will be dragging and dropping our OSD elements. And that's really important because if you don't select that and you don't have that area cropped and you put something down toward the bottom of the screen, it's gonna crop it out when you uh, actually look through the camera. So now with the crop in place as we need, we can grab the items that we actually wanna look at. My personal preference is I like to keep an eye on my main battery voltage. So I'm gonna put that over. Yeah. I also like to see current draw. I'm gonna put that right there. I like to see my MA, my milliamp hours drawn, because uh, I usually fly 1300 or 1500 batteries. So when I see that that's reading like a thousand, it's probably time to land soon. And the last thing I like to see is timer two, which is total armed time. So that can give me an idea of efficiency. So I just like to have the things down at the bottom. Uh, the warnings element is on by default. I recommend leaving it on. It'll yell at you if, if something's going on that you need to uh, be warned of, like low voltage or whatever. Uh, oh, and of course, RSSI. Let's get that turned on. Receiver signal strength indicator. Got him. All right. I'll put that up in the upper corner here. That's a good thing to keep an eye on because that starts getting too low. You should probably turn back and start heading back towards yourself because you are going to fail save and save. All right. And with our on-screen display set up, that really concludes everything we need to do in the Betaflight configurator. So I'm going to go ahead and disconnect. And I'm going to fire up Windows Boot Camp because the last step that we need to do is, as we mentioned, fix the motor direction in BL Heli. And unfortunately, there isn't a BL Heli 32 suite for Mac. So we've got to get into Windows, which is really annoying. All right, we're in Windows. Getting our BL Heli suite open. Let's get our quad connected. We've got our ESCs connected to our BL Heli suite using Betaflight pass through. All right, our ESCs are already on the latest firmware, so we're not going to flash them. We know we need to change the motor directions of motors two and three. So I'm gonna right click motor two. I'm gonna select reversed and I'm gonna hit right setup. Then I'm going to right click motor three, hit reverse, and right setup. Now there's a few little things I'm gonna do to all the ESCs. So I'm gonna get them all selected together. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on a little bit of current protection. So these ESCs are rated for 35 amps. So I'm going to set the current protection to 35 amps. And theoretically, that should make the ESCs uh, more resilient to potential fires because even if your, uh, your, your, your prop gets bound up in some leaves or something, you're trying to shake yourself out, you're not going to draw so much current through a particular ESC that you can catch it on fire. And 35 amps through four ESCs, it's like over 140 amps. I mean, it's more than enough power that you're ever gonna get out of, uh, out of one of our LiPo batteries. So you're not gonna actually limit your power, but you should give your ESC some additional protection. There's this other option over here called motor timing. You can set that to auto. Yeah, drag it all the way to the left to get it to auto. I couldn't fully tell you why that's an advantage, but Oscar Liang told me to do it. I also saw that over here for PWM frequency, if you're running BLA 32 and AK8K, you should drag that up all the way to 48 hertz. Write that. And I think we're done. Oh, wait, no. How could I possibly forget to turn on the LEDs? Yeah, most BL Heli 32-bit ESCs feature some LEDs, so we can go ahead and pick our color. We've got R, red, G, green, and B, blue. Since we've already got purple props covering up the ESCs, we'll make them shine pink. So we're gonna turn on the blue and the red LEDs. 
right setup. Look at that. We've got some pink lights coming on here. And anything else? Oh, I almost missed break on stop. Turn that up to 100%. It's gonna, um, when you disarm your motors, bring them to a stop quicker. The only other thing we could do in here is we could go into the music editor and get your ESCs to play a different custom startup tone, but we're not gonna mess with that. But while we're in here, let's triple check motor direction. Spool them up a little bit. One is good, two is good, three is good, four is good. All right, we've got beta flight configured. We've got our ESCs configured. So that concludes everything we need to do with the computer. This quad should be flying really well. I can't wait to get out and uh, get it in the air and crash it as we often do. So thank you guys for hanging out. Hope you learned something. If you haven't seen the build video for this yet, check it out, link in the description. And also check the link in the description for store.rotoriot.com where you can purchase everything you need to build a quad just like this. Uh, stay tuned for more episodes. I'm Ladrib and I'll see you again soon.